Well, I've, I've had um, people leave the churches I've pastored because of my tattoos. Now, some of you are like, those are tattoos. I thought they were dirt. We have to leave now. <laughs> um, and, and, and they said was, you know, tattoos aren't biblical, and you, re, you had them, you, or you got them after you became a Jesus follower, and so since that's not scriptural, and you really can't be a pastor then, so we got to leave. I've had people leave the churches I've pastored because they've said you preach too little grace, not enough grace. And then people say I, you, I'm, we're leaving because you preach too much grace. Well, that was intriguing. I've had people threaten me. Threaten me for a variety of reasons, but, but really threaten because they were losing the influence and power that they had had for years and years and and they had been the directors of the church and and it really didn't matter what leaders or pastors or the holy spirit were doing but they since they were losing influence and power the threats began to come and one of the big ones that loved this one was we're not going to give to the general fund anymore because we know that that affects your salary we're going to give it all the missions and i said praise the lord for missions they're going to benefit pretty big now. I think that's good. Thank you for your giving. And, and threats in other ways. Talk, threaten the leaders, other leaders of the church, saying, you know, you got to get rid of this guy or you can't let him or him influence you. And the leaders are like, well, we believe this is of God. But yet the leaders would then show up and say, we need to change our strategy and things we're doing because their people are upset and they're not going to give money or they're not going to support or attend. And I'm like, are we choosing God's way or the way of the people? Now, that's a struggle and a challenge, right? That's a struggle and a challenge for leaders. It's a struggle and a challenge for any of us who are living our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I have found people living their lives in the power of the Holy Spirit are going to ruffle some feathers and some folks aren't going to like it. And the way folks try to control what God is up to is by threats, is by coercion, is by saying they're going to do this or not do this. And the question becomes, and we're going to see this, see this in the text, do we go God's way or the way of the people? And so that's what the text is about this morning. So you can turn to, to Acts, but, but just to remember where we're, where we're at is, is right, the Holy Spirit, Spirit comes upon this group of disciples and everyone that's gathered because they don't know what to do. They know Jesus is alive. He's gone to heaven. So they're doing what they know, right? They pray and they elect a new disciple or they have God appoint one. But other than that, they're like, what are we going to do? And then the Holy Spirit comes upon this group and the church is born. And then we see, what, what do they do? Is, is Peter and John are going to the temple last week as they see a guy, we're going to find out today, he was 40 years old, so he's been sitting in front of the temple for a long time as a crippled, lame adult. And Peter and John show up, they see him, and they say, man, we're going to set you free in the name of Jesus, stand up, and here we go. And this guy is praising God, the people are like, whoa, and it's an amazing thing, right? I mean, someone gets set free. Imagine, imagine if, if we're out and about and, and, and we're setting people free from whatever their bondage is. Don't you think that people should rejoice? Well, they would be, right? But who's, who in our story is not going to be rejoicing? Well, we're going to find out because there's a group of people that aren't rejoicing at the liberation of other people. And so Acts chapter 4. But before I do that, I want to share this statement, this quote Again, you can disagree or agree with these things. It doesn't matter. Speaking holy words has serious consequences. These are not words that simply speak of God. So we're not saying, we're just saying, hey, God's cool, God's great. You know, Jesus, we love him, he's my savior. We're not talking about that. We're talking about holy words that bring consequences are words tied to the concrete liberating action of God for broken people. Those are holy words when we begin to set free the marginalized. When we begin to engage those who are marginalized, we begin to engage those who are oppressed, those who need to be set free, those who have been subdued by other people, those who have been kept in check by others, in the name of Jesus, those are holy words. 
Such holy words bring the speakers of such words into direct confrontation with those in power. And that's exactly what's occurring in our text today. So I want to look at this. This is a remarkable piece of text because what's going to happen is we're going to see today how leaders and those in power respond to this man being liberated. And then next week, we're going to see how disciples respond when threats are given. Okay? So two different, two different ways. So Acts chapter 4, verse 1 through 22. So as they were speaking to the people, right? So we're continuation here. Peter and John speaking to the people. The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, I want you to notice, these groups of people normally don't get along, these leaders. The Sadducees are your, probably your most conservative and wealthiest of the leadership, okay? And so they, they do things their way. They believe they're right. The priests, which later become essentially the Pharisees, they a little more liberal, and they believe they've got it right. The captain of the temple is the guy that's in charge. And these groups of people normally don't work together well. But look, when there's a challenge possibly to their headship and their leadership, their control of the people, they come together. Not sure the world's changed much. So verse 2 is essentially saying why the Sadducees are ignored. I mean, the Sadducees are annoyed. Okay, that's really what verse 2 is talking about. So they're greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so here you have, well, Jesus, and now you for sure have these disciples that are saying Jesus was resurrected. And they're preaching it, and they're teaching it in the name of Jesus, and the Sadducees are saying, wait a second, that's a doctrinal error, and if people start to believe that, then maybe they'll start to believe and follow Jesus, and if they start to follow Jesus and believe in the resurrection of the dead, then we lose our control over the people. It's an interesting, well, it's not, not that interesting, I guess, but I, I, I was Googling heresy and Googling doctrinal falsities. Would I say that? I don't know. False doctrine. You know, there's a billion videos. And you know who isn't? The, the, you know the person that has the right doctrine? The guy making the video. <laughs> Everybody else's doctrine is false, but the guy making the video. He never brings into check or challenge of his own doctrine. But what he's good at is pointing out everybody else's false doctrine. And then you pull the next video. He or she does the same thing. And you go on and on and on and on. And everybody's doctrine is false except the guy pointing everybody's out. So then I'm like, okay, this is stupid. So let's, let's look at the gospel. Who, who, who says there's something wrong with how people are proclaiming the gospel? So I clicked on people I actually respect and like what they say. And they're like, preachers today do not preach the gospel. I'm like, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's hear this. Well, the gospel is pretty simple, right? The gospel is the good news. What is the good news? That Jesus is the Son of God, that He came to save and set people free, that He died and shed His blood for us, that He was raised on the third day and He ascended into heaven. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Well, what these people were doing, these preachers who I, are scholars or people I like, were, were adding their doctrinal things to the gospel. So if you don't preach the right thing about, about um, where women fit in the church, your gospel's wrong. If you don't preach, preach the right gospel of what the end of time looks like, your gospel's wrong. If you don't, and go on and on and on. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why do, I, why do all these people have to be right? Why do all of these people in the, in the people that they want to follow them have to be right? Well, because they want the followers. Because they want the authority, the power, the control over the followers. And so we could, every one of us could stand up and say something that we don't believe about somebody else's doctrine, right? But none of us should ever disagree with the simple gospel that Jesus is the Son of God 
shed his blood and died for us. Right? There's where we should is where we should agree on. Now, I'm not suggesting doctrine is bad. I, I have doctrinal beliefs, but I want to tell you they've changed over the 30 years, 40 years I've been following Jesus. They ebb and they flow. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I believe that. I, I'm believing this now. I think the crazy part is we're all going to get to heaven and we're going to be like, Jesus, the Son of God, yes, worship me in Him. Oh, I had that wrong. Oh man, I had that wrong too. Oh my gosh. Right? How, 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 how arrogant it is when we think our doctrine is right. And how arrogant it is when the Sadducees believe their doctrine's right. So what do they do? Well, they arrest them. They arrest them. And because it's evening and we can't deal with things, let's just put them in jail for the night. Because that's a threat, isn't it? If you don't do what we say, if you don't do it the way we want it, what actually we can do is imprison you. But Luke wants, to not, wants us to know what happens when the authorities try to squash the proclamation of the gospel. Someone tell me what verse 4 says. And the number of men came to abide 5,000. That suggests 5,000 families, 5,000 times something. In the midst of Peter and John and persecution and threats, the gospel explodes. The gospel explodes, Peter's, I mean, Luke's trying to tell us. And we see this. As, and we see this around the world, right? As, as people t in, in other countries, not so much in our country, right? Because we are really not persecuted and in, in dying for proclaiming Christ yet. Um, but my guess is when that happens, the gospel will explode. And, and the number coming to Christ will explode. And we'll get to the martyrs around the world later when we get and talk about Stephen because there's more martyrs in the world today than ever. People losing their life for proclaiming Christ. So the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes. Woo, we're getting them together now. They together together in Jerusalem. And Luke knows the names. This is amazing. Luke's got the names here of Annas and Caiaphas. He's, I mean, historically, the names are correct for that time period. Right? So Luke has called them out. And this is essentially the family. This is the high priestly family, which, which the text tells us. But it's clear. Luke has the names right with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all were of the high priestly family. All those who control how people function within the temple atmosphere, so to speak, have come together to deal with these, true, these two rebels. Who, by the way, just liberated a guy and set him free. That's their crime so far. And when they had set them in their midst, they said, By what power or by what name did you do this? Essentially, they're asking, Whose authority are you working under? Who gave you the authority to help a dude? Who gave you the authority to walk up to the 40-year-old guy who's been in front of the temple lame for who knows how many years he's been there begging? Who gave you the authority to do that? Is that not a preposterous question? But they feel threatened by the power of which these guys are functioning. But a guy that's been lame for 40 years could be set free now i want to use a stupid maybe not a stupid example but just a dumb example here and, and i was thinking about this so, so christine i'm glad you're here because is it okay if i use you thank you she didn't even get to answer thank you though <laughs> i appreciate that christine so christine you work at the thrift shop right yeah okay so imagine if the elders of the church went to christine and said who gave you the authority to work at the thrift shop and christine said well well i was praying and i felt like god told me to go work at the thrift shop and so I did it because of Jesus. And we're like, yeah. Did any one of us tell you you could work at the thrift shop? Well, no. Well, then you can't work at the thrift shop. Because you only get to do what we say you can do. You only get to function within the body the way the leaders of the body say you can function. And so, oh, I know you're helping people, Christine. And I know you're helping people need clothes. And maybe you hand, give money every now and then when your heart breaks for that person. Whatever. But, Christine, did, we didn't tell you you could do that, so you can't do that. That's how preposterous this is. That's how preposterous it still is today. When the body of Christ says, I'm sorry, you can only serve in these ways. Well, but, but I, I, I 
feel like Jesus has said for me to go do that. I'm sorry, you don't get to do that because we didn't authorize it. Or actually, we don't agree with this thing you're doing. It doesn't fit into. Well, well, the Holy Spirit's leading me in the name of Jesus. It doesn't fit into our beliefs or the way we would do it. So, are we hearing that? It's the same reason, and I, this is probably a cop-out. It's probably a cop-out. The same reason, well, as I pastor a church, I, I hate strategic planning in the church. Because what happens is when we put a five-year plan in place, the Holy Spirit tries to jump in in year one, and we're like, I'm sorry, Holy Spirit, we got a plan. <laughs> and you, I'm sure you gave us the five-year plan, and there's no way, Holy Spirit, you ever want to change your five-year plan. And so we can't listen anymore, God, because we figured out the plan. At your leading, of course, but we have a plan. Because we like control, people. Let's be honest, right? We, we all, some of us are real control freaks. Some of us are minor control freaks. But we all fit in some reason we like control. And the Holy Spirit, who I believe is a gentleman, well, he likes us to lose control sometimes. And we can't imagine that. Because if someone loses control in the Spirit, I mean, really, is that really real anyway? Because it's not orderly. It's not, I mean, it's not the way I expect the Holy Spirit to work. Are we getting it? Okay. So the same with authority. So Peter... Verse 8 says, filled with the Holy Spirit. This is where his power is coming from. This is where his word's coming from. This is how he's going to exhort them. He says, rulers of the people and elders. He respectfully addresses them. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, Luke is a brilliant chooser of words. Because this word crippled could mean weak or lowly. Okay? So, you could read this in a lot of different ways. Because we've done a good deed to, to a weak person or someone who's on the lower echelon of things, by what means this man has been healed? Again, Luke's brilliant in his word because this healed could mean um, being set free or liberated. Ooh, come on, Luke. So if you are being a good example today, and so let's read it a little different, concerning a good deed for a weak person, a marginalized person, by what means this man has been liberated or set free, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you want to know our authority, rulers? It's the name of Jesus. And what does that mean? It means by all authority, that all of our authority and power is coming through Jesus via the Holy Spirit. By the way, I want to remind you, Peter says, whom you crucified... But whom God raised from the dead, Sadducees, resurrection, by him this man is standing. Peter and John are saying, what's it because of us? It's a couple of dudes filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. This man has been set free, this man has been liberated, this man has been healed by Jesus. It's a threat to their power and authority. Because if Jesus can do what Jesus just wants to do, how do I control folks? How do I keep them in line? How do I keep them believing what I want them to believe? How do I keep them moving in the direction I want them to move? How do I essentially keep them, you know, penned in, so to speak? If Jesus can do what Jesus wants to do through people. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, saying, you people missed it. You've missed it. And this stone, Jesus, he's actually become the cornerstone of this brand new movement. And there's no salvation, and there, no, and there is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Another great use of a word here because this, this saved means just healing, wholeness and healing across the board. It just doesn't mean eternal healing. It means physical healing, emotional healing, Mental healing, spiritual healing, it means Jesus is the healer of all man in every respect. So how do our leaders respond to that? Well, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, once again, we perceive them as hillbillies because they're from Galilee. Nothing good comes from Galilee, right? They were uneducated and common men. They astonished. I mean, the leaders keep being astonished by the words of the Holy Spirit. 
and they recognized they had been with Jesus. This is the old, old crap moment for them. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, they were with Jesus. We killed him, didn't we? I thought we got rid of that mess. But they were with him. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, right? I mean, if you've been set free after 40 years of not being free, what are you doing? You're standing next to him like, I'm hanging with these dudes. I want to be a part of their thing, right? I've been sitting in front of this temple, and you guys just been giving me cash, doing nothing to help me out, really. These guys have given me life through Jesus. So I'm hanging with them. They had nothing to say in opposition. The leaders are like, um... He's healed. He's been set free. What do we say? So but when they had commanded them to leave, so Peter, John, you, you, got, you got to go. Take that guy with you too, by the way. They, they conferred with one another. What shall we do with these men? What are we going to do with these guys? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. There's nothing we can deny because the guy's standing right next to him. So what are we supposed to say? Well, he's not really healed or free, though we all saw him there for 20 plus years sitting there begging for money. We can't deny it. Verse 17, but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Let us tell them what they can say and can't say. Ooh, does that still play today? Let's tell people. Let's threaten folks, right? I mean, well, I... I know that still works. People try it, right? Well, it doesn't work if you're going kind to of follow the Holy Spirit. It shouldn't work, but people still try to threaten, right? Leaders of the empire, leaders in church, they try to threaten people. They try to bring fear to people of what can happen to you if you do this thing that threatens us. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Don't do it. Don't speak about the name of Jesus. Don't teach in the name of Jesus. Off limits to you fellows. Peter and John say, well, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you got to decide. For we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. I love this response. Not once in any of these silly videos I was watching online did anybody speak about what they'd seen and heard. They all spoke about how everybody else was wrong and what they should think. They never spoke about what they'd seen and heard. They never spoke about the power of Jesus. They never spoke about how the power of Jesus moved them. They never spoke about the power of the gospel in their own life and how they saw the power of the gospel move in others' life. They spoke how when you don't believe what they believe, you're wrong. Peter and John say, look, we can't contain ourselves. We have been so moved by the Spirit of God. We have seen so much amazing stuff while we walked with Jesus, and now apparently while we're, you know, walking in the Spirit, and how do we not talk about what we've seen and heard? You know, when I'm talking about what I've seen and heard, I'm not trying to get you to conform to me. I'm trying to get you to follow Jesus. When I'm, trying to, when I'm not speaking about what I've seen and heard, but trying to preach to you what doctrine you have to believe, I'm trying to get you to conform to my beliefs. We have to learn to recognize the difference. And people in power who want power and who want to control do not want you to think for yourself. And that includes the church as well as the empire. They do not want you to think for yourself because when you think for yourself and you allow the Spirit to move you, whoo! Who knows where that's going to happen? Who knows where that's going to take you? So church, let's not walk up to people and say you're wrong. Let's not walk up to people and say your doctrine is messed up. Let's walk up to people and say there's no way you could be saved. Let's, not, let's walk up to people and say, you know what I've seen and heard? You know what Jesus has done in my life? You know the power that flows out of me in the power of the Spirit? Could you imagine, instead of being out and, and saying you're all wrong, we're all right, and we just were about setting the oppressed free and dealing with, uh, with the empire and religion who were oppressing people. And, and 
without saying we're right and you're wrong, but just being a part of setting people free, how the empire would and the religious leaders would freak out. And it's why denominations, right? I remember I told you I have a friend who, it's a friend who had been serving in Haiti and then was a pastor, and now he's getting ready to work for another mission organization where he's going to be training and caring for pastors around the world. And his church wouldn't send him because sending an organization thought women could be pastors, and they didn't. And they thought that was going to mess them up. Mm, I don't even want to tell you what's going on in my head right now. I don't understand that. This guy who's going to be out encouraging those who are telling people about what they've seen and heard say, we don't have any place for you. Because doctrinally, we're right and you're wrong. Let's not be those people. Verse 21, And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Why? Because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They're like, we can't do anything to him because they have the support of the people. But the persecution is beginning and will continue. I want to end with this statement, this quote. I steal everything that's good. But I want us to get this. Because the gospel isn't meant to oppress. If you ever hear an oppressive gospel, it's wrong. Because Jesus was a liberator of the oppressed, not a mascot for the powerful. If someone is trying to conform you through Jesus, it's not the gospel. Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, changes. The Holy Spirit is the one who changes. The Holy Spirit is the one who sets free. It is Jesus who sets free. So when you hear a gospel that is getting you to conform to a certain belief system or a certain way of thinking, or you have to ask yourself, is it, the, is it the gospel? Because Jesus came to set people free, not to condemn them. Jesus came to save the world, not to condemn them. Jesus came to liberate. And this movement that we're going to be reading about in the book of Acts is coming to set people free. And it's an offense to the empire, and it's an offense to religious leaders. Friends, let's be liberators like Jesus. Let's be gospel proclaimers that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's in His name that we do what we do. Amen? Lucas and Bill are going to come, and we're going to sing this, what a beautiful name. The name of Jesus is what sets people free. It's in that power that we live. It's in that power that we function. It's in that power that we go forth. In the name of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for setting us free. Thank you for the privilege you've given us to be threatened, to be persecuted, to be called names, to be imprisoned. For the privilege of being present with those who have been taken advantage of, with those who are caught in the bondage of even wealth. Lord, may we be liberators like you, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. And may the gospel that we proclaim be a one of freedom not of oppression, not of conformity. And may we live in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 